Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and this is Crosscutting Concept 7. It's on stability and change. In other words, how things remain the same, but how they also become different over time. And so if I were to say these three books are sitting on a table, is that stability or is that change? Well, that looks pretty stable. But if you were to watch the atoms in the bottom of the book and the atoms in the uh, table, we'll find that there's going to be a lot of interaction between the two. There's going to be small indentations in the table. The book's responding to those. So even something that looks inherently stable is going to change over time. And if we were to come back in a million years, I promise you the books won't look the way they do. But if we were to look at the moon and see how the moon changes over time, how it goes through the phases, we would say, well, that's definitely changing over time. But we would also find stability within that. In in other words, it's always going through the same phases every month. And so we can start to see a pattern of stability in the moon over time. And so understanding these things is important for students because in science it allows us to see patterns, explain patterns, and then explain phenomena. And in engineering, we're trying to improve design. And so if we really have an understanding how a system works and how to control that system, that gives us a greater ability in engineering. And so remember, what is a system? A system is a portion of the universe that's separate from the universe. And so a system, for example, could be a reservoir and a dam that's holding the water back in the reservoir. It could also be uh, your house or a room in your house could be a system. But it also could be at the level of a small cell, like in this case we have a bacterial cell. Or it could even be at the level of a galaxy. We could think of that as a system. And so all systems have two features that are going to allow it to remain the same or change over time. Those are going to be the controls. The controls allow matter and energy into a system and out. And then the other thing we have that we haven't talked about in these concepts yet is the idea of feedback and feedback loops. So let's say we look at a reservoir. And so a reservoir is going to have controls. Controls are going to allow water into the dam. And then it's going to allow water past the dam. And so those are going to be controls on the matter coming in. And it's also inherent the energy. But then we have feedback loops within the dam. And so a good dam engineer is going to set it up so that he can measure the amount of water that's coming in and if there's more water than he can hold he better let some out and if there's not enough water he better not let any go and so that would be an example of a feedback loop or what about inside a bacterial cell a bacterial cell is going to have controls on what material gets in so what matter does it require what energy does it require but it's going to have feedback loops within the cell itself so it can maintain stability and so feedback loops are very very important and a great example of this is a speed sign so let's say you're driving down the road and you see a speed sign and it says you can only go 30 miles an hour but this one says that you're currently going 32. Well we can use what's called a negative feedback loop to maintain that. So what are you going to do? You're going to slow down and as you take your foot off the accelerator the temperature is going to drop. Now you're going too slow you're going to start to speed up and so eventually we can reach a Stability. We can each reach that stable point of around 30 miles an hour. So negative feedback loops keep us around a set point. Positive feedback loops are different. So in a positive feedback loop, I'm going to move away from that as quickly as I can. So if I see 30 miles an hour, I'm like, I can go faster than that. I can go 39, I can go 51, I can go 72. I can peg it out, moving way away from that speed limit. So that's a positive feedback loop. If we want to move away from a set point, then we use positive feedback. So let's talk about an example of a negative feedback loop in your house. Well, your thermostat is a great example of that. So if it's cold, you basically are setting the temperature where you want it to be. So let's set it to 70 degrees. If it's colder than that, then it's going to turn on a heater. And it's get warmer and warmer and warmer until it gets to over 70 degrees, let's say around 71 degrees, and then it turns the heater off. And then it's going to get cooler, and then it's going to turn it on when it gets too cold, and then it's going to keep going back and forth, and so it can keep it around a set point. Now, I only have a heater in my classroom, so in the spring when it gets really, really hot, an air conditioner would be nice as well. And that would be used if it gets too hot, you could turn the air conditioner on and we could bring it back to a stable environment. What's a positive feedback loop? That's when we want to move away from a set point. So an example in the life sciences, have you ever noticed that all the fruit on a tree go ripe at the same time? Well, the way they do that is they're giving off a gas called ethylene. That gas is going to diffuse out. It's going to trigger other apples to give off gas and become ripe as well. And so now we get a feedback loop where they're all quickly going ripe at the same time, but that's because we're increasing the amount of this ethylene. And so one bad apple really can spoil the lot uh, by passing this gas to the others. And so 
we're getting at this idea of e equilibrium. So equilibrium is when the internal system tends to stay the same. And it's very important in life sciences, earth sciences, and physical sciences. And so this bird is maintaining internal equilibrium. And we tend to call that homeostasis. So it's going to have a stable internal temperature. It's going to have a stable solute concentration on the inside. And the th same thing is going to occur in this fighter jet right here. It has to maintain equilibrium. And if we fall outside of that, in a bird, we call that death. And so if you can't maintain equilibrium, you're going to die. Or in a plane, if it runs out of gas, for example, if we don't have that control set right, then the plane is going to crash. And so what is our goal in the science classroom? We want students to understand stability and change. And the progression should be taught in the following way. In the early elementary, we should start to develop language of stability, change, and feedback in our students. As they move into the upper elementary grades, we should understand and explain patterns and how patterns change over time. As we move into middle school, we can really talk about the specifics of the different types of feedback loops, both positive and negative. And then as we move into high school, we want to understand how very complex systems work and how they maintain a stable internal environment. And so how do you teach this? Well, you start by giving them the language of stability, change, and then sensing patterns. And so a great way to start with this would be a balancing activity. And so if these were perfectly balanced, what students could play around with on a, on, a on a simple lever like this is we can find relationships between the two sides. So how do we get it to maintain stability? And then what happens if we don't maintain stability over time? If we're looking at patterns as we move on into the upper elementary grades, great examples are to look at um, weather, for example. So the weather is somewhat stable during the day, but it's going to change throughout the seasons. And so by measuring the stability and the changes and making predictions about that, we can start to understand how phenomena work. Or if we go back to the moon, remember the moon is going to go through phases. And so if we were to just keep track of that in the classroom, what phase is it in, we can then use that to start to build a model about how the moon and the phases of the moon work. And most people don't really understand that. Even a simple animation like this, we could pause it right here. Let's go back to the beginning. And we could simply go through it. You can see that here's the date. So this is November 10th. It's going to look like that. If I go forward to, or I guess that was the 18th. If we go forward to the 20th, it's going to look like that. If we're going to go forward to the 21st, it's going to look like that. And so we could use this to see how we're getting change within the moon, and then we could use that to make predictions about how the phases of the moon work. As we move into middle school, we should understand the, the importance of maintaining stability on the inside. And so for us, we have a temperature of around 37 degrees Celsius inside our body. So that body temperature is super important to maintain. And we use feedback loops, negative feedback loops, to maintain that. And so talk about that with your students. What happens if your temperature gets too warm? What are you going to do? Well, we're going to sweat. That would be one good thing that we're going to do. Um, we're going to start to vasodilate. So we're going to move blood near the surface of the body to lose that. What happens if it gets too cold? Then we're going to start to shiver. We're going to start to vasoconstrict. Uh, our hair is going to stand up on end. And so that's a stable internal system of body temperature. But that's been selected for. So this spider right here, if we're looking at it with the heat, this is a, a thermal imaging camera. You can see that the person holding it, their body temperature is going to be around 37 degrees Celsius. But if you look at the spider itself, its body is going to be really, really cold. And so now we've got an endotherm and an ectotherm. In other words, this spider is not maintaining a stable internal environment. It's what we call cold-blooded. But you can see that it's got a really, really warm abdomen here. And so feedback loops are used to maintain that. And then as we move on into the high school, we should really understand how stability and change affect one another. And so computer modeling or, or mathematical modeling is a great way to get at complex systems like uh, natural selection. So this right here is a net logo simulation. It's looking at the temperature of peppered moths. And peppered moths, remember, in, uh, in Europe were really light in color. And then during the Industrial Revolution, they became dark in color. And then as we started to clean up the pollution, they started to become light in color. And so this simulation, I'll put a link down below, you can use to measure how they changed over time, how we actually saw evolution. And you can see a real increase in the light population from a random start, but then we can see what happens if we change that environment. And so stability and change are important. We use feedback loops and controls to maintain those, and I hope that was helpful.